Welcome to Girlish Gurus. I'm Joy. And I'm Susan. And we're here to have discussions about topics on many subjects that we hope are informative, uplifting, and fun. So let's get started. Let's. Hello, welcome back. Welcome back. Well, this is part two of our amazing interview with Katie Waite. And it has been amazing. We are lucky enough to know Katie personally, and we hope that you've listened to part one and have the background of Katie's life. And this part is just going to give you further information about what she's experienced and then how she's come through that and is now living a beautiful, full, happy life. And if you are thinking about embarking on a journey as a creative at any phase or season of your life, this is the interview for you. Right. It is so inspirational as Katie is, but we think that the story just... um, It's amazing. It's so uplifting Mm -hmm. for for anyone. Yeah. But I think especially if you're a creative person. Right. She's such a bright light. She is. And so here we are with part two of A Creative's Journey with Katie Waite. Enjoy. Enjoy. I remember seeing Katie walk in to the class because we're mutual redheads. <laughs> so right away, yes. you automatically connect. Yeah. It I, just happens. Yeah. Bl- blue eyes, red hair, freckles. It, it, yeah. It's like a little soul sister. Yeah. We have a, <laughs> we have a little club, don't we? <laughs> Us redheads. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. But then we all connected just by being in that class together and Mm -hmm. sharing our stories and yes. But I remember when you came in, and I remember you were, you were like small. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You Mm -hmm. didn't say a whole lot. You were there in the class. You were present, but you were not really looking for the attention of the class. Mm -hmm. You were, you were just there to. I, I felt like be distracted like mm-hmm. I felt like to be doing something else to get out and do something else but I could tell that you were not do you know what I mean I know what you mean because yeah. that was how I felt <laughs> she was nervous because she and I opened up very, to each other pretty quickly because I had just lost my mom oh yes and Katie had just finished up so we were both pretty vulnerable at that mm-hmm. time and I think that's why we we're able to open up a little bit to one another. Mm-hmm. So well, I remember even like we had would have these exercises where we she wanted us to write. You know, we had our laptops, yes. and I remember being like, I can't type because of my right hand. I'm just so even now to this day, I get very self conscious. But back then, even more so. Like it was like I hadn't been out with people like this before since my you know my surgery. I was nervous about. Sp- speaking in front of people i remember i that. um i was like afraid that people would see me like typing in such a weird way because i couldn't use the keyboard in a, a normal way because of my hand so i think we were sitting next to each other and i was like i don't remember i had to, i t- said something i always feel like there's a disclaimer like oh if this looks weird because i you know i don't even remember but i just remember like opening up to you mm-hmm. about something yeah so i think i felt nervous about being in this group of people who didn't know me or my story right and standing out in a weird way because like i would have these like this these deficits well lucky for you there were a lot of strong characters and personalities in that (laughs) writing group because i remember you sliding in yeah and being quiet sliding into your seat very very quiet and then sliding out (laughs) being very very quiet that's what i remember Mm -hmm. and i don't remember you even bringing a computer I remember you would bring your notebook. I think I gave up on the laptop (laughs) after the first week. (laughs) So I did not know, never in a million years, and this just goes to show you, you don't know what somebody's going through. That's right. You really don't know. Here you were maybe two years out from having your second surgery. Not not even. uh, um, A a year and a month or something like that. So, Because that was November of 2018. Okay. So here you were. A year out from just having big time brain surgery, I had no idea. I know none. No, none. Mm-hmm. 
you look normal to me. I mean, you <laughs> didn't. I didn't notice anything. Mm-mm. Did you? No, no, no not at yeah. all. It's interesting when people talk about invisible disease or illness, like people who are struggling with something that's only on the inside, whether it's like an immune, right, um, uh, right, autoimmune uh, disease. Yes, thank you. That's what yeah. I'm trying to say. Um, and that's I remember just talking to friends about that or Dan, like I always felt this pressure sometimes to like put on a happy face and to appear normal and, and like, I'm not struggling, you know, when I was with family or neighbors, I always felt like I needed to put a appear or put on a happy face to not make other people uncomfortable or make them worry but on the inside i would you know be struggling um whether it was emotionally because it was a very yeah i think that even looking back i'm like that was really hard i it wasn't because i thought i wasn't gonna make it necessarily it was more just like the i'm trying to think of how to say it I just felt like I went from being a normal person because it took me a long time to get back to that sense of normalcy too. Right. My first surgery, it was difficult. And then I eventually crawled my way out of that and I was like happy and healthy again and to have to do it again and to have even worse um, side effects. And I really felt like I lost a sense of who I was. I mean, the first thing I tried to tell the nurse as they were rolling me back to my roll room, because I was um, kind of awake. Like, they didn't put me back to sleep after the surgery. I remember begging, please put me back to sleep, because I just was like, I can't do this anymore, because they mm-hmm. woke me up. And I think they're trying to, like, manage their, their they, they don't want to over, um, overwhelm your system, which I appreciate. But... And then my speech, you know, I was trying to talk and I realized I couldn't talk. The first thing I tried to tell the nurse was, I'm a singer songwriter. And I was trying, I think I probably came out like gibberish, but I was like, this cannot be happening to me. I'm a singer and I'm a guitar player. And I was trying to like make, make oh, the motion. Yeah. Like, the, I, why do I, why can't I speak? Why can I not move my wrong, right arm? And I remember they said, we're going to go get your mom and your husband. And I was like, no. I told them not to get them because I was like, they can't see me like this. Uh, It was when you are uh, a creative person who's like, not that my livelihood livelihood depended on it, but it was like a a sense of identity for me. Of course. Um, And the thing that was what I thought was ruined in that moment were the things that brought me joy in my identity like as as an artist and a musician so i now that i'm thinking about it it's like it sometimes you just kind of push it all to the side but like it that was probably some of the depression and the sort of darkness and the emotional trauma that i went through after the surgery that I kind of just sat in for a lot of months because I felt like who I was, and also even as a mom, oh, we haven't even talked about that. <laughs> Taking care of your child when you've gone through all this, oh, whether it was the, yeah. first, the first surgery was particularly hard because he was, you know, he was so little. He was still a baby. Um, trying to take care of a crying baby when you have a brain injury that or noise can't even like can't even handle noise oh, is gee. difficult so that was another you know we didn't even talk about that but now he you know this second surgery he was seven first grade and was so brave and so sweet and really handled it all so well but he's also a very emotional sensitive kid and i just worried constantly about how this was affecting him so there were some really hard days you know I, I my speech got better but it was not back to normal i had a number of um deficits uh there's a, a praxia which is the actual motor function of getting words out of your mouth which is what i mostly struggle with today not today today but t- cur- currently um i will i'll get stuck on a word and i can't get it out of my mouth aphasia is where you mix up words you want to say blue but you say red instead 
it's like pulling the wrong file out of the mm-hmm. final it's like it's close in meaning like before i said years instead of days that's a very good example of aphasia aphasia and then the other one is distortion of speech and i can't remember what that's called but i had all those things and i felt weird and different i had like my the right side of my face was a little droopy i felt like unattractive i felt like my face had changed um I couldn't play guitar or piano in the way that I used to. So it's like all these little things mm-hmm. that are not really little, all these big things. And even writing, like, you know, journaling and writing was like, and typing. And that was like, it's like all these things that I treasured. And momming, it's like everything was hard and different. And it didn't feel like me anymore. So going back to that, what we were just currently, or sorry, what we were talking before. I just, it's like kind of an invisible thing though. Like on the outside, I was getting better. And was like, oh, you look so good and you, you're so brave. And I'm like, well, it's hard when people say you're brave because I'm like, I don't really have a choice. <laughs> I like appreciate when people say that. It's so kind and like, I know what they're saying, but like, what I, what am I supposed to do? You just got to keep walking, you know, one, one foot in front of the other. But sometimes i just wanted to like break town and like yell in the middle of the cold sack like i'm not okay <laughs> like, i'm sure i actually mm-hmm. everyone's you know or if they did have a hard day and i was kind of down the b- dumps i felt like i shouldn't like i should be grateful to be alive and be happy and positive and that's hard too like and i i'm definitely like your typical artist that has like your the mood swings like i wanted to be that happy positive person who's recovering from you know a cancer diagnosis see i don't even like that word i don't even use that word in my own family it's like some people say brain tumors are cancer some people don't and i have chosen not to but at the same time it's like to be realistic it is you know in that camp but like i uh, yeah it's hard to when you look normal on the outside i always told dan and like if i had like my leg in a cast it'd be more obvious like mm. that i have an injury but it's all on the inside your brain is injury injured so like some days i just didn't feel right and it was hard to even explain that like i would just feel completely fatigued and i still i'll still have days where i'm like my brain feels very fatigued and i'll have to take a nap or just chill out and it's hard to not that you have to justify it to other people but Back then, it was so um, prevalent and like constant. Like I just felt kind of off all the time. But it's hard to like explain that. Right. So I think that was a little bit of a tangent. But going back to coming coming back to that conversation about the writing group, I yeah, I felt not like myself and like kind of on the inside, you feel different even though no one knows it right you know yeah so here you are <laughs> no that's i mean what a story <laughs> i know i can't even i know i can't even <laughs> <laughs> so here you are a creative person just recovering from your second brain surgery big one big brain surgery a mom to a seven a year mom. old mm-hmm. and you're at that point and i guess to me that's the point where I met you. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, this story is like before that point and then that point forward. And mm-hmm. so since the time I've met you, you've really taken a lot of steps out into the creative world again and layer on top of all of this, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> to me, uh, what a brave and courageous story this is. But can you kind of walk us through... I mean, there's so many different ways you could go with the story, right? Mm-hmm. You got the wom- the female aspect of it. And we haven't even talked about menopause. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we got the female aspect. I'm as- not there yet. <laughs> uh, well, but no, but by this time, you're in your 40s, right? Yes, I was 40 when I had the second surgery. Okay. So by this time, you're in that age group where we're focusing on. So on top of you having this second massive surgery 
you're also now no longer in your 20s and you have that other aspect of creativity barrier of being older and then you layer that on top of the pandemic so you have all these things going on right and yet you're still embarking on another phase of your creative journey so that to me is incredibly interesting it is and that's the the story that i think is going to be so valuable to so many people that you're already experiencing this level of difficulty but then on top of it you've got the pandemic you've got that whole issue of oh am i too old because a lot of people think that and you're still moving forward so can you talk a little bit about that and even within that context too uh, now that i'm hearing you say all that it was it's an interesting age to go through all this stuff because i also was straddling i think like the young mom Mm -hmm. kind of um season but entering into this you know mid life season as well Mm -hmm. and to add on top of all that it was just like i feel like a lot of my time was stolen from even the first surgery and i always wanted a second child always and i spent most of that six years after my surgery trying to figure out when i'd be healthy enough to be able to do that so to have that curveball thrown at me at that age it was another layer of just kind of I didn't even think about that. But yeah, yeah. Because I that's what I always wanted. And even at that age, it's like very doable. And so and that, that was where my head was. Okay, well, now I'm well enough. I keep, I've had six right. years of good reports. So I think it's I'm strong enough to, you know, think about that. And we were kind of talking about that. So then this happens where you're diagnosed again and still like, you know, it's still in my brain. It's always like, well, is it like how... I, start doing the math (laughs) yeah Uh, 44 now but on top of that was like another layer of just like sadness of like this keeps ruining my plans and not you know going through this i not only do i feel like i'm missing certain parts of my own my child's life because i was not well enough to participate but it's just like what you have in your mind you know keeps get getting Your vision of your life. Yeah. Right. But then you also have to accept sometimes that life is not going to turn out the way that you think. And when does it ever? (laughs) Right. Sometimes in good ways and sometimes in negative ways. So, you know, so I've, I've actually really struggled with this whole idea of like time passage and nostalgia because I think I I actually have uh, tried to deconstruct that with um therapists and friends in in the past just trying to why do i have such a hard time like moving forward it's hard for me to age it's it's hard for me to watch my son every year that he turns older it's just like you know it's hard and he has a birthday in like two weeks and i'm just like oh like every grade he goes to he's in fifth grade now like it's like very weepy for me i think that's normal for a lot of parents but I think that there is because of the, my journey has been so weird as mm-hmm. a like my motherhood journey and because of it not turning out the way I envisioned I think that and so yeah and going back to like I think that I was sort of tr- straddling my 30s young little kid season and this like entering into midlife which I'm in I and uh, denial about it. <laughs> but yeah but at the same time and then I'm finishing up this trial and right when I start feeling better is when the pandemic hit I mean I remember my doctor saying like I said d- December 19 is when I finished up and she was like you're gonna start feeling better around March April of 2020 because oh you wow. everything is going to be washing out of your system the chemo and that's was pretty accurate i really started feeling better i was getting more energy um and then <laughs> then covid hit um now this is i see it's such an interesting the pandemic was such an interesting time for me because i developed a lot of anxiety like everyone else yep mm-hmm 
but I also especially you with a suppressed immune system oh yes right. I was I was terrified I was one of those people in the beginning was like a neighbor's like across the street I'm like don't come on <laughs> I'm like we could yell we're good let's just yell back and forth it actually eventually there was kind of a group of us including my cousin and her family who lived across the street and other neighbors with kids you know we really kind of bonded together like we had a little bubble Mm -hmm. that we felt safe being around that we were all pretty conservative in terms of like not going anywhere and it was actually kind of an interesting time of like coming together and really like the kids just it was like one of those that summer was really pretty sweet actually because like the kids were just running all over the the cul-de-sac in the street and really bonded and like us all the parents like I just felt like Everyone was finally home. Right. People weren't as busy. Um, really got close. And so that was actually, there was a lot of upsides. I hate to say that because it was such a horrible time in the world. And like I said, I had a lot of exa- anxiety about going out. But there were some definitely some sweet things that came out of that time. And then also, I I had told, I spoke told my speech therapist the year before maybe I'll like to work on my speech I'll do like an acting class or something I'd always wanted to do an acting class I'd only done that one in New York and that was for theater um but I always was like it'd be fun to do that and so I thought maybe that would be like helpful for my speech um so during the pandemic because everything went online I actually had a really good friend who was living in Wilmington who had been doing acting classes because Wilmington's a big film industry. Um, There's a studio in Wilmington that was doing acting classes and they all moved online. So this friend of mine was like, why don't you do it with me? Um, I'd actually like helped her read the other parts for like when she was like, you know, turning her tapes in for class. Like I had helped her and I was like, I think I could do this. Like, I was like, so how does it work? Do you do it live? Are you just like, She's like, no, you have like a number of days to like practice and you do your tape and you send it in and then we like watch them and then you give feedback. So I was like, I think I could do that. Like, again, everything comes back to like my fear of how I'll sound and like I, as long as I had time to practice it with the, the script, I, I think I was like, this is like less scary than like in person. So I started my first acting class, film and TV acting class, which I had never done before, um, june of 2020 right in the middle of the pandemic (laughs) and that has been (laughs) life-changing um i am still taking classes two years later and the opportunities that have come from that one little step in that direction have been kind of (laughs) mind-blowing right for sure yes and i remember we were actually still doing um we were still doing our writers meetup, but we were doing it over Zoom. Right. Yes. And I remember you talking about, hey, you know, I'm taking the acting classes and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's. I know. That's pretty impressive. And then I remember when you said, yeah, so I'm going to go to Wilmington. I think it was Wilmington, right? When you shot that pilot. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. That was one of my first jobs. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the trailer for that, I kind of heard about it a little bit late because I don't get on Facebook all that much anymore. Oh, that was my Charlotte project. Yes, I know mm-hmm. what you're talking about now. And then someone said to me, I think it was you, Probably. hey, you need to check out this trailer. For, and I was watching it. I actually watched it when we were doing <laughs> one of our Zoom meetings, a writer's meeting, and I was blown away, man. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> I was terrified. It was a horror, right? Yes. And I was terrified. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Katie, it's behind you. <laughs> oh, it was funny. so good. And yeah. you've done several things since then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I was in that class, it was, again, it was for confidence, my speech, and for fun. And then I just always need like outside val- validation, I think. But as I would get encouragement from my teacher and other students it was like okay maybe i can actually do this like maybe i should Mm -hmm. start auditioning it took me a while like some people want to like they've never acted before and they in the first month of class they just want to like skip all the steps like i want an agent i want 
be on TV right now. I was like the opposite. I'm like, oh, just I just want to take class for a while. <laughs> so I didn't start auditioning until maybe like that fall or winter. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I booked like my first two jobs. Like again, small. This is all local. This is not like I wasn't on TV. Like <laughs> I wasn't on like Grey's Anatomy or anything like that. This is like small local stuff. But still like in the southeast even all that stuff is quite competitive and i'm learning that it still feels very uh, overwhelming um because the southeast is actually becoming a pretty hot uh area for with filming um but yeah i had two small things that i booked like quickly not quickly but you know that winter so a few months after um i started class and then yeah there's I I didn't have any representation at that point. It's just like you find your opportunities. There's like um, something called Actors Access where you just log on and all the jobs are there. And again, this is during COVID. So now I see like how the, the normal way it is. Like there's just tons and tons and tons of opportunities. Back then it was like very few. Op- and I had to balance my anxiety getting out into the world with taking these jobs like putting myself out there to even audition and then if I would get it as I remember my, my first time to Wilmington to do this this project I was like terrified and then I got headshots that same day and I was like I don't know if I can take my mask off like it was just you know you're balancing all these fears with also this new um journey so it was an interesting time to start all that but yeah I've ever since then I've done like I don't know yeah a handful of things so, well, right the play I think I was trying to I, count I think it's like maybe 10 now like, I know film projects um I don't know again like it's just it's for fun but it's like it is interesting how and I did sign with an agent um this year um yeah I was in a musical I got to see Katie in the yeah, play season came to see me that was so it nice was so and that good. was that was also very eye-opening because I was like that was a very tiring experience and I was kind of comparing how, where I am now versus a year ago or two years ago or three years ago because now it's it'll be four years since my surgery this November which is interesting because I feel like it was two years ago because I feel like COVID right. stole two years right. I'm like everything feels like I, I feel like I missed like that whole those couple of years um so yeah that was it feels like it was just yesterday but um it'll be four years and that musical really showed me how far I've come in terms of like my, my, my physical um stamina Mm-hmm. Um, but even still, we'd have like 12 hour days where we have two shows in one day. And it was exhausting. I think it was exhausting for everyone. For a lot of reasons. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. But I was sure. like, I would not have been able to do this a couple of years ago. So I feel like it showed me how far I had come. Um, but well, yeah, it was and great. In addition to all this wonderful acting that you've been doing, you also started playing the guitar again and writing music again. And then working kind on of. <laughs> working on your memoir. Yes, those things. When I have time, it's hard to to balance all these things. I wish I had more time in the day, um, or more energy. I guess I should say because balancing auditions. You know, now that I have an agent, it, it's not just me. Like I can't just be like eh, I don't want to do that one. <laughs> like I feel like I I owe it to my agent who's working hard for me right. to to do all the auditions that come my way if I can if I'm in town so and then I'm still in class so like to to, because I class is important not only to keep it fresh and to keep it fun um but like it's training like I feel like if I want to be a good actor like I need to keep going with this Mm -hmm. um which is kind of interesting you think that you learn everything and you're done and then you just go do the thing no like you keep training and getting better so I feel like that takes a lot of time. And then I have Miles, my right. child to take care <laughs> of. Um, and then I I do, like, I, I want more time to play guitar. to Because honestly, if, what would really help my hand is to play piano and guitar more often. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be, like, built-in OT for right. my hand. 
Um, so I do try to make time for that. It kind of comes down to the bottom of the pile sometimes. Um, I have a hard time finding t- time to write music. Um, I've felt that way for years. Ever since having a child, it feels like that creative process is for me used to be very long and lingering and I could just like be up until three in the morning if I wanted to writing music and now it's hard to fit that process because it was always just a long process for me and it was just long and lingering and I don't have that kind of time so I have a lot of half songs written <laughs> um and then but yes yeah, so we all met as we said in the memoir class I felt very pulled after my second diagnosis to write a book. I I always felt like I was supposed to write a book. I just didn't know what it was about. I was like, I don't, like, what am I going to talk about? And then when all this happened, I was like, okay, well, maybe that's what I'm supposed to talk about. Um, And I think that, like everything else, I think things are going to be faster than they actually are. So here I I am, like three years later, not much further along with that project. But yes, I... I try to make time for that too. I just when when we all get together, sometimes we we meet and write together. That's and that's why I really appreciate this group and our friendship because I really feel like it's important to tell my story. And I think without our group, I wouldn't continue. Like it's hard for me to sit down and make things happen. And so I really appreciate that we've kept up all these years so I can like sit down and and make time for that yeah so we'll see what what happens with that but yeah i feel like a lot of things have happened since i guess 20 whatever 2019 there's been a lot of um forward movement in the arts yeah share with us where you are in your health journey now Mm -hmm. as of today how are things going how are you feeling yeah Things are really stable and really good. Um, I get scans every two to three months. Um, it's about two months now. Sometimes we go back and forth different, um, you know, depending on everything's going. But everything so far has been, it's hard to say it out loud. You don't want to I know, <laughs> jinx right? anything, right. even though I know that doesn't exist. But everything is has been stable. Um I just recently added something to my arsenal. So, I mean, there's just constantly changes and um, new treatments, which is really exciting. Again, kind of going back to that immune, uh, gene mutation that I have, the IDH1. Um, I was told 10 years ago that that was a really good thing to have. And even my doctor in New York, I remember him saying, in 10 years, there's probably going to be treatments that don't even exist right now and he was he was right so there is this um all the people that study this and figure this stuff out is pretty amazing but there's a medication that i'm on right now there's zero side effects there's i don't even there's nothing that affects me at all it's just like taking a vitamin basically i take it every night and it basically i can't even describe it because it sounds too scientific it's over my head but it it takes the energy out of the things that feed the cancer cells wow. so that's, it, amazing. That's, that's the way they describe it to me on the basic level and i'm probably even saying that saying that wrong but it basically tries to sim- suppress the growth so and it actually was like a, a drug that was used for leukemia patients i believe and figured out that they could also be used for my type of tumor again very specific to what i have um and targets those the idh1 Interesting. so um so i'm i'm taking that i just started taking that in march um she was saying my doctor was saying that it's something that they they've been giving their patients that have been living with this kind of low-grade tumor for many years that are stable but you know, if there's a possible possibility to keep it stable and or shrink it, that's obviously the I- ideal. So right. um, they do have patients who've been on this for a couple of years who not only st- are stable, but they are seeing shrinkage. So they don't usually see that for six months to a year. Um, I haven't been on it that long. 
so that I have my next scan in September. So of course, the last scan I had, I was like, okay, it's ready for big news. It's all <laughs> gone, right? Because I still have this little chunk left, um, and it was, you know, it hadn't changed. It hadn't grown, and that's in our in our world, the brain tumor world. No change is. Those are the magic words. Right. I always want it's gone. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's what I want. Um, but of course, you know, ch- no change is like, that's the best thing to hear. But um, if I could go further than that and have it disappear, that would be my, that's my prayer. That's, that'd be my miracle. Um, so yeah, we'll see the next scan, see if there's anything happening. But in addition to that, I just still try to eat really healthy I try to keep myself strong and healthy. Like that, the habits that I formed after the first go around, um, I'm definitely not as, I guess, strict. Strict with myself. I was very strict. Um, literally eating zero sugar. I did not touch sugar for like six years. Um, maybe like. Uh, you know, on vacation, I'd have half a cookie. I know that sounds crazy. Like I'm on extreme diet. It wasn't for that reason. It was really, you know, I, the messaging in sort of the wellness world. And I do think there is definitely truth to this. Like the more sugar you consume, consume, you know, sugar can inflame the body and you don't want your, your body to be inflamed. It's not a good environment for fighting off cancer cells. So I just took everything to the extreme though. So I've come, I've swung back to a little more balance in my life, um, but I still have those healthy habits in place. So I do what I can to keep myself strong and healthy and have these, these scans and I'm on this medication and hopefully everything will remain good and stable. I have moments of freak out for sure. I'll have like a random night where like, Mm. Uh, I don't know what happened recently. I felt like something happened. Oh, my speech. I was just like getting a hard, I was having a hard time getting my words out. I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, what does that mean? You know, just is there something growing? It's like, it's really hard when you've gone through yeah. the worst. Um, it's like when you've heard the worst news that you can get, get mm. twice, it's hard to not go back to that place. Yeah. Um, Brene Brown calls it foreboding joy. Oh, the example she uses is she's watching her children sleep and she's loving it and she's so grateful and happy and joyful. But in one part of her mind, she's waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm worried something could happen, or, or et cetera, et cetera. So, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. that is exactly it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and there's a lot of days when you're not in that space. Sure, and sure. things are good, but yeah, I do have freakouts every once in a while. So wow. things are. Things have been good, though. My health is good. I want to take a couple of minutes for you to tell us how you have moved forward in your creative process and what it has meant to you to be able to get back to that. Because I feel like a lot of people who are going to be listening, they are in a situation where maybe they want to take steps to do something creative and they want to get back to that part of themselves that they have put away for some reason. And also being a woman in your mid 40s now, I think that's another layer on top of this whole process that is really critical to exploring for women who maybe don't have the illness story that you've had, but have changed seasons in their life and they're ready to do something more interesting and just get back to that critical part of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like for me, there's always like this part of me that is calling or just a feeling or like a gut feeling like it is time to try this. It's time to put my put my put foot back into the the waters of whether it's art or acting, writing, because I do there's so many things that I dabble in and you can't do it all at once. Um, But if the way I've kind of moved through these different um, genres, I guess it's always kind of led by this kind of feeling. Um, My first surgery, I 
after I sat and wallowed in, <laughs> you know, felt sorry of myself for a long time and trying to deal with my recovery and all the emotional stuff and getting back to taking care of my baby at that time, I, in my gut, I knew it was time to start making art, like with my hands, like paper, cameras, paint. I had so much anger. That's another whole podcast probably but I had so much just like emotional stuff sitting in my body because I I was angry I was really frustrated and upset like why did this happen to me and I remember being on a plane we were flying out west to see my dad at Christmas time and this was just after my surgery so only a few months and feeling you know it was one of those trips where just like everything was going wrong and I was I still was I felt not good you know traveling kind of there's so many sensate or so many mm, sensory things right um and so my brain hurt i had a lot of brain fatigue i just didn't feel good and i remember just feeling like i was going to explode with like uh, it's hard to explain i i just it wasn't even just anger it was just like overwhelm it's like when it's hard to explain it you know when you talk to another person who's gone through what i've gone through like it's you can kind of share notes um, like brain fatigue is a thing that, that we all, a lot of us experience, it's very hard to explain. I remember sitting on that airplane and just feeling like I was going to explode with overwhelm, like in, you know, burst into tears, just like I just felt bad. And I had this weird voice, maybe it's God, just like my gut instinct was like, I need to start making art. And it was like in on the airplane, it was kind of out of the blue because like all this stuff is sitting inside of me and needs to come out. And it took a while to kind of listen to that voice. And when we moved to Florida, I, ha- I set up my little, I, we had an extra space that I can like set up a little art studio. Um, and I pretty regularly um, made the art. I signed up for classes for me. It's all about accountability. <laughs> I need to like, not, it's different for everyone, obviously. Sure. For me, if I sign something myself up for something, pay money, or insert myself in a group, kind of like our, our writing group, it helps me stay the course. And that's why right now I, I do my art acting classes because it keeps me in the world and keeps me excited. When I was, was doing art classes in Florida, I would go every Thursday, I think it was Thursday, <laughs> every Thursday night, and I was with my group of artist friends and it kept me excited in the process. I needed to make things with my hands in that season. After my second surgery, writing was calling to me. I just knew, I'm like, I just need to get words, the words of what's happening to me out out of my body on the paper. I And I knew even it was a little too soon to start talking about what I was currently going through, and I still to this day haven't necessarily written the part two of my story for my memoir because it was too fresh back then. But I just knew I had to start writing. And again, it was just that feeling, that calling. And then when the the whole acting thing happened, it was just again, it was more like okay, it's it'll help my speech, um, and it'll give me confidence. And my friend is like encouraging me to do it, and I'll just try it. And when I'm in that class, when I'm on set, when I'm acting, I just feel alive. I just feel like to be a part of a story, to help bring someone else's story to to life is a cool, magical, and creative experience that it's so different than writing or like writing my story or painting so I have, and you know, of course there's music too. And I have to just sort of circle through all these little, all the different passions that I have. Cause it, again, it is hard to do it all at once. Um, so I just kind of listen to that, that little voice. Cause I feel like there is so much more, it's more than just being creative. Like, you know, some people might look at that like, Oh cute. She has a little craft room in her house and she does a little craft. That's so cute. It was like a life saving thing for me. It was an emotional therapeutic thing when I was making my art in Florida. Mm-hmm. It's so much more than just 
try, trying to tap into that like inner artist from when you were eight years old or whatever like as an adult trying to listen to those voices and diving back into whatever creative space you're being called to it's always deeper it always mm-hmm. it's like it's it's always peeling the layers of who you are back and it's it is like self therapy in some ways and i think so many messages and um aha moments can be born out of like finally allowing ourselves to go back to those places these created places and and, like participating in lending yourself because like we said earlier being involved in the arts is very vulnerable i all i recently said to my husband acting is so vulnerable i had no idea i had no idea like i recently did an audition tape up in my little studio where i have a, a little you know all my lights and everything set up so I can do my at home self tapes and I wouldn't even let him look at this it's like I had to like break down and cried and I took all the makeup off my face because I just wanted to they wanted a really vulnerable character and I was like I cannot believe I'm doing this and I'm going to send it to this random stranger and let them see like this like me breaking down it's such a I mean, but all these spaces that we're talking about, these creative spaces, it's very vulnerable. Yeah. We've had discussions about this before, and I think, Katie, this just helps to affirm what we've talked about as far as being creative. We all have that creative side. And so many of us bury it and don't listen to that little voice that's saying, no, this is a part of you and you need to listen to it because it's going to help you to truly express your emotions it's going to allow you to be vulnerable which is important for all of us to be and i think we need to listen to that we need to learn to do it every day Mm -hmm. i mean it it's hard but if you can listen to that it's only gonna create a more joyful fulfilling life for yourself it's also healthy yes (laughs) it's like it's a release of, and that's kind of goes back to what I was feeling on that airplane. I felt like almost sick to my sick to my stomach with stress. Yeah, and it was like you need to make art because it was like opening a window mm. or a door to let. And yes, like ugh, therapy, counseling, um, letting yourself have a good cry. There are so many different ways to release the emotion, but there are certain. I've learned to personalities personalities and I have one where you kind of it's needy it's neat and tidy to keep everything inside right and I kind of grew up in that way just I didn't I wanted to be quiet and didn't want to make a fuss a lot of us are that way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I you make be the good good girl uh, keep everything Mm -hmm. locked up one of the best pieces of advice that I ever heard from for um, in mothering was a, th- a play therapist that we were taking our son to just when he was really little. Because again, I had this complex like, oh, everything's been ruined because of all my trauma. I, I didn't know how it affected him when he was a baby. Um, but she said, these tantrums, you know, all kids have tantrums, like let them happen better out than in. That's what she said. Mm-hmm. If you don't allow your child to have their emotions that come out and be messy then they're going to do it anyway but on the inside and that's what creates anxious adults and people who have a really hard time and that i was like oh my gosh that was me i locked it up inside but that goes back to like i do think that being creative in whatever space that you are feeling led to be creative in it opens the door and allows all that emotion to leak out to come out which is benefit it benefits our health it's not good for us to have so much stress stress and anxiety and emotions locked in the deep part of our bodies so if you were talking to somebody who is thinking about embarking on some type of a creative venture What advice would you give that person? And, of course, our audience is women 45 and older. And a lot of us look at the social standards of if you're X number of years old, you're not going to be able to 
do some kind of creative venture. And I think we need to kind of get past that. So what piece of advice would you give for somebody who's maybe thinking about embarking on that kind of journey? Self, self-expression, mm. some way to release I, that. I think that's the perfect time to do it. Like, why not? Just mm. go for it. Because, I mean, I think in some ways it's easier now at my age than when it was when I was 25 and like I felt more self-conscious about other people thought because I had to have this you know nice career laid out in front of me and now it's just like I think it's just a good time to shed the the opinions of others I mean this is like there's no better time I think to start dabbling or full force going diving in whether it's just a little bit here and there or just like going for it fully because also we have we have hindsight we have experience behind us um it kind of is like what do you have to lose you know and i also i re- i recently did this research on my own because it always i always like examples examples and how how it's worked for other people that always inspires me so i was recently googling and looking at articles of actors that got their success later in life and it just was like so cool to see Mm -hmm. how many you know not that i even need to be this super well-known person but like just to see how people how their their career in the arts really started in their 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, just Google that. That's really inspiring. Yeah. Like, what actors got their start later in life? And then you'll just see um, examples. And I so that, for me, I think is always inspiring to seeing other examples. And also, there, there's tons of writers who are in that well, category. Well, artists. Grandma artists. Moses, right? Wasn't she? <laughs> yeah, that's She was, right. like, pretty far up there when she first started painting and she cranked out mm-hmm. a lot of works yes so. it's so inspiring mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah i think my advice is pretty simple just do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i agree i yeah. agree and that, that's been something that i've spent a lot of time thinking about as we have embarked on this podcasting right adventure <laughs> well, and the thing is, it's so great now. There are so many classes and things online that you can take. Yes, so if they aren't easier. available to you locally to go to live, oh my gosh, it's, you know, the world is your oyster as yes. far as classes and things you can do online. That's so true. So that makes it wonderful, too. In some ways, it's like you can even start mm-hmm. it there because it feels a little bit, I think it is hard to like... um show up in the real world like what we did and with that class i did feel intimidated and i did feel mm-hmm. kind of small i'm i'm glad i did it but like it's mm-hmm. almost like if you're feeling that way like i don't know if i could bring myself right. to like show up to like a group of 15 people or 20 people what you just said soon susan is so so right and such great advice because it you can just start from the comfort of your home right. and on your just, couch. And yes. Mm-hmm. And just yeah. start the process and then you'll know right away. On, yeah. Right. On the, when you're on the right path. You know what Eleanor Roosevelt said? You must do the thing you think you cannot do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when you are doing something and you're feeling so intimidated by it, and I don't want to get pushy about that kind of thing, but a lot of times that's sort of your notification that yeah this is probably what you ought to try Mm -hmm. because you're so terrified and you're so well i want to do it but i feel like i can't do it because of a b or c and that's the thing that really will propel you forward and maybe you're not going to be the next grandma moses or maybe you're not going to be up on stage rocking when you're 70 (laughs) like some people but it's not always about that it's It's, not it's about self-fulfillment Right, and it's about mm-hmm. self expression, about that journey, which is so important. Right. But I am so proud yeah. of you, Katie. I'm Thank so proud you. of you. <laughs> Me too. Thank Me you too. so much. <laughs> You're so brave, and you've done such, I mean, gone so far in the middle of a pandemic, which mm-hmm. continuously is something that I'm amazed and impressed mm-hmm. by. And so. it's been fun to watch you these last couple years mm-hmm. just continue to grow, and mm-hmm. we're going to be 
on the sidelines applauding you as you get all these new auditions and, <laughs> and your Oscar. See. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we need to be on that red carpet mm-hmm. somewhere. I'm just saying 100%. You're, you're you're not just going to need representation, you're going to need a lawyer. I'm just saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Somebody's got to be looking at those contracts. <laughs> okay, Katie. Well, my goodness, thank you for sharing your journey. It's quite a journey and it's inspiring to both Joy and me, and I know it's going to be inspiring for other people as well. Mm-hmm. We are sending all kinds of light and love to you and and hopes that this will continue for you. We know it will. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, this has been such a great experience talking to you and such a an amazing story. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty privileged that you're sharing it here on I our do, I do too. little platform that we're just kind of now getting started. And, you know, for me, that's, I'm really appreciative of that. Me I thank too. you so much for that. Well, yeah. thank you for asking. This has been really, uh, yeah, therapeutic for me as well. So Good. thank you for asking and encouraging me to do it. Cause I was a little nervous as you know, <laughs> well, and it is, Whenever it's like we were, what we were talking about before, whenever you're stepping out into something new, yeah, that's a little scary. Yeah. yeah. But, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's been 100% worth it, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Me I do too. the things that scare you because it keeps you feeling alive. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's that's right. And I try to, I made a lot of decisions when I was younger or decided to, to do, to not do certain things because I was nervous or scared. And now as I'm older, I realize I still get really nervous and scared about everything, but I do it and I feel so like alive afterwards. Right. And this definitely fell in the category of feeling nervous and scared, mm-hmm. but I knew that it would be worth it and it'd yeah. be a good thing to do. So thank you. Thanks thank you. again, KV. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. All right. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of Girlish Gurus and Hope you'll join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Girlish Gurus. We hope you'll join us next time for another fun and interesting topic. And please be sure to check the notes for information and links that were included in this discussion today. Also, don't forget you can find us on our social media platforms, starting with Instagram, Facebook, and now including YouTube. You can find us by searching Girlish Gurus. And please remember to give this episode a good review and share it with your girlfriends because the more interaction we get with our podcast episodes, the more episodes we can post. Finally, you can find us on our website, girlishgurus.com. Thanks again. See you next time. Bye.